Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hi everyone, welcome to this episode, Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I'm your host, Jake Devonball. With me today is our co-host, Chris Bixby and Matt Bingo. How are you guys doing? We're good. Doing good, Jakey. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Who do we have today? Today's guest we have for today. He is an actor. He Part of most of us know what he's done. He is he was a U.S. narrator for Thomas and Friends between 2004 through 2012. He's been part of other projects, which we will talk about that in a little, in a little bit. Here he is, Mr. Michael Branton. How are you? Happy to have you here. I'm, I'm good. How are you guys doing? Doing good. very good. Well, I've, I've yeah. actually yeah. never never done a podcast with uh, on mass here. This is like a whole group. I think the most I've ever done, it was like two people, but this is like, here we are, four of us. Great. Amazing. Wow, that's awesome. So now, a podcast is radio, is it not? It's a broadcast. It's not a vi- Is it visual? Yeah, well, the, this this podcast, we have a video version on YouTube and an audio-only version on places like Spotify, uh, Amazon Music. Amazon Music. Yeah. And all, and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. So, um, as a king things off, we know we know who you are. But for those who don't, would you care to introduce yourself a little bit? Okay. Um, well, uh, you guys are probably all a bit young to remember um, the show that brought me to England, which was Dempsey and Makepeace. But while I've been here doing that, that's thirty three years ago i think or more huh. it's 35 wow. years ago dempsey and make peace so you guys weren't even an idea um but uh you probably know captain america yeah oh right? yeah mm-hmm. yeah of course, of course. Um, right i did captain america the first avenger i was senator brandt and i created the character of captain america to use for pr uh you know for the enlistment into the wow. army so it was a great role and it was a great opportunity to work for marvel and um you know to do uh one of those big movies it was uh, fantastic um what else can i tell you i am originally from brooklyn new york um where are you guys uh, i'm from uh, massachusetts and jake and matt are from maryland mm-hmm. yep mm-hmm yeah. Right. So um, anyway, that was New York. I grew up in New York and um, I started acting and I went to acting school in New York. And um, one of my first gigs was um, I, I met an agent. I kind of like talked my way into his office because I took in the in the old days, they used to have a directory in the lobby. They still do. But not all the agents put their names on it anymore. I took two names. I called one and said the other guy said he should see me. So it worked. He did. He met with me. And um, he said, you know, you'd be right for a Broadway show that's casting right now. In fact, get over to that office. Gave me the address. And I ran over to this office, into this um, Broadway producer's office. And I auditioned for a Broadway show called Does a Tiger Wear a Necktie? And they loved me. And I was barely out of acting school, so I was completely raw. I didn't know what I was doing or what I couldn't do. And I came back for a callback. They liked what I did. They called me back again. And then it came down from all the people they were seeing to two actors, me and some guy named Al Pacino. And... uh, Al won the Obie Award, not the Obie. Yeah, the Obie. Obie's off-Broadway for the Indian Wants the Bronx. He got the edge and he got the part. They asked me to understudy Al plus play another role in the play. And uh, I did. 
So not too shabby. I'm I'm on Broadway, you know, yeah. and uh, I was watching this guy Al for two or three weeks in rehearsal, and I thought, boy, did they make a mistake? This guy's a dud. And then the third week, he let it out, and I had chills. I had never seen anything like it. It was amazing. Wow, what a performance. And he then grew from that in rehearsal to what he did every night in the theater. And eventually, uh, although the, the show closed in one week, a bad review from a very powerful um, critic named Clive Barnes. Uh, but Al won the Tony Award for one week on Broadway because he was that amazing. Okay, time for you to ask a question. <laughs> Al, oh, that, that's awesome. That that's very interesting. Winning a Tony after only a week. Yeah, amazing. So, how did you first get into acting? Well, um, I was going to uh, college at night for law school, and I was working during the day for some shady guys in the, um, well, let's call it the beauty supply business. And I was really kind of unhappy with both. Um, what happened was I was coming home from law school and I had a pain in my back and about three, and I was living with my parents. Um, I think it was 17 or 18. And couldn't I couldn't get up the stairs I had to pull myself up the pain was so intense I thought all right I'll take two aspirin and go to bed but I woke up it was unbelievable about 3 a.m I couldn't move my legs so I kept banging on the floor with the shoe and finally my dad came said, what's with all the noise I said I can't move my legs why not I don't know and then I wound up having this uh, surgery I, and it seems my mother knew since the time I was born, there was a small hole at the base of my spine, which would have become an extended coccyx, you know. Um, and what happened was um, this put the pressure on my spine. I couldn't walk. I had this serious operation. And that gave me a time out in my life where I thought about what I was doing. And I didn't know what I was doing. I really, after experiencing some law school, I, I didn't want to be a lawyer. I also didn't want to work with these guys anymore. So I think I met this girl at the outpatient. Um, I had a cane. I was limping then. And um, I think she was attracted to the limp. Anyway, uh, we had a date. And I told her, you know, my state of the life. And I could tell a stranger. Uh, how unhappy I was. And um, she was laughing hysterically. And I said, what's so funny? And she said, you are, you ought to be a comedian or an actor. Bom. That was it. I said, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to be. How do you be that? You go to a school. So she rattled off a few schools and uh, I walked in the door said, I want to join up. They said, it ain't the army, you know? And at that point I had never even seen a play. Um, I did have a favorite actor. That was Marlon Brando oh. from On the Waterfront. Mm -hmm. He was mm -hmm. amazing. And um, that's what I wanted to do. So I went to the academy for two years and it was amazing. It was a change of life. So complete because here I was with people who were of a like mind, but of all different worlds all together. And uh, it was the best fork in my life because now I had a plan. Now I had a, a mission. Definitely. So I gave myself two years to be a movie star or I'd quit. <laughs> so... Years before, Thomas, you had brought up this show earlier, Dempsey and Make Peace. 
First off, for, for those who don't know, uh, could you describe that series a little bit? Sure. Um, I was living in Los Angeles. I was working as a writer in development at 20th Century Fox. And things were going slow because a, um, a new head of studio came in and all the deals for the scripts were kind of on hold. And it was a frustrating time. Nobody was getting anything done. Everybody was waiting for a green light on a movie, get a production going. And my agents called me in for a meeting. And they were the two biggest agents in the world. Uh, Mike Ovitz and Ron Meyer, the head of the CAA, Creative Artist uh, Agency. And um, that's when they pitched me. They did some great aging, told me that it was time that I should consider a pilot or series, television series, which I had refused to do up to that point. And um, so I said, all right, because I like doing television movies. I did a couple dozen of those. Uh, right. Anyway, mm -hmm. I, I took them back to my office at Fox and I started reading them and chucking them over my shoulder. Rubbish, 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 rubbish. And then there was this one. It was on funny paper because it was longer and thinner. It was um, English, A4. We use legal size in America. And A3, I believe. Um, and I liked it. So I called my agent and I said, I like this one. Oh, that was a mistake. We shouldn't have sent it to you. Anyway, I said, I know I'm not right for the part, but I've got an idea if you can get me a meeting. Anyway, long story short, I had a meeting with these two producers. It was, it was a, um, a meeting that CAA kind of pushed upon them because they were packing their suitcases while I was standing in the doorway. But I told them my idea for this character. And then it went from there to reality. They liked the idea. They, they said, yeah, that's, that's good. That's what we want to do. So... I flew from L.A. to England and began a uh, English-American co-production um, for London Weekend Television, and it was called Dempsey and Makepeace. And I was Dempsey, this hard-ass uh, New York detective. <laughs> and um, it was with his partner, Makepeace, who happened to be Harriet Makepeace, uh, who was a, a lady. She was um, aristocratic, but that was her secret. Anyway, I thought, wow, like having a partner like Tinkerbell to what I was used to, but the dynamics worked. And that was what my idea was to the producers. And um, again, it did work because it became, at the time, the 25th most popular show in, tele in British television history. Wow. And wow. it was uh, watched by 20 million viewers every week. Wow. That's awesome. These days, you know, if you take the three most popular shows in England and add them together, they don't come up to 20 million. So um, it was, you know, quite something back then. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, what, what was your experience being on that show? Dempsey uh, and McPeace. It was a great show. I had, I had an amazing time and the, it was a great crew. It was, it, everybody was there to make it happen, make it work, no matter what the situation. I mean, we had only one set in a warehouse. So wow. everything was on location. And I remember one of the first days, if not the first day, I was in the trailer and I had just done this scene where I drive out. You know, I was taking advantage of the New York department because they wanted to get rid of me. So I rented a Mercedes convertible. Right. I think it was what was it then? A 280 or a 380 SL? I don't know. And just to make them pay. And um, I was driving around with the sunglasses on the top down and um, we did the morning shoot. And it was lunch. And I went to the lunch truck and I was the only one there. And I said, I thought they called lunch. And they said, well, yeah. And I said, where's everybody? Said, oh, they all go to the pub. 
Then they come back 10 minutes before the end of lunch and eat. <laughs> it was a whole different world I wasn't used to, you know. Um, anyway, uh, and he'd say, new potatoes, Mike. I said, <laughs> what? He said, new potatoes. I said, as opposed to old potatoes? Anyway, I, I learned, you know, couldn't get a cup of coffee. That was difficult that back then. But anyway, um, so then it, the sky opened up. I mean, it was boring. And there was a knock on my door. Yeah, we're ready. I said, you're ready to do what? They said, finish that scene. I said, I'm sorry, uh, but how's that going to work? He said, what do you mean? I said, it's raining. They said, yeah. Well, it won't match. You see, I was driving with the top down. And it was a sunny day, and now it's raining. See, this is the L.A. mindset, you know, for filming. That's why L.A. existed. They wanted to go somewhere, and L.A. was the place where we had the most consistent weather. So everything would match. It created Hollywood. Anyway, they said, the director's walking by the trailer door, and he said, everything okay? And I said, well, you, you're planning to finish that shot. And he said, yeah. I said, but it won't match. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, it was sunny earlier, and now it's raining. He said, well, it's England. I said, what? He said, the weather changes. And I'm thinking, wow, people in England get it. They know the weather changes. It was raining, before, you know, it was sunny before, now it's raining, tops up, windshield wipers on. That's not a problem. In America, you get 5,000 letters about, hey, this didn't match. You know, uh, so I learned a lot. You know, it was uh, about real filmmaking. You know, there were times that I would get in this car, turn on the lights, turn on the camera, turn on the sound, do the clapboard, drive off and do the scene. You know, everything was kind of like making it up. Wow. It was, it was exciting. Yeah. So I'm sure all oh, the... Thomas fans tuning in are wondering, can you uh, talk about how you became the narrator for Thomas? Oh, I was doing a play at the National Theater uh, called Jerry Springer, the Opera. And okay. it was it was brilliant piece. Um, it was Richard Thomas wrote it. Um, and he thought as he watched the Jerry Springer episode, this is like opera conflict. And he put it all to music. I was the only one who spoke. Everybody else in the cast sang. And it was amazing and rude. Much better than Mormons. I mean, it was really funny and fabulous. Anyway, during that time, I got a call. And they said, would you be interested in um, narrating um, Thomas and Friends? You know, Thomas the Tank Engine. I said, yeah, I would. So I went in and they, I did like a, you know, a kind of a test. I did about uh, one or two episodes. They loved it. And at that time, they were all little trains, real trains that went around, you know, like on, a, on, on a big table, you know. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't like today where it's CGI, you know, they're cartoons. Yeah. It's like all yeah, the rest. Right. And I actually did 63 different voices over the eight years that I narrated Thomas. Wow. You know, wow. Oh, yeah. so Thomas. Thomas. Thomas, we need some candles for the children's party. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the island of Sodor. This oh, is yeah. my friend Percy. You know, it was, it was, yeah. uh, oh it my was gosh. Wonderful. You can't believe the names of some of the famous people who called me up to ask me to do that on their tape machines for their kids' birthdays. Oh, know. wow. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Happy birthday. It's Thomas. <laughs> 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 Might want to awesome. save that for your birthday now, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Like, yeah, I have all the one well, the. I have all the seasons I watched Thomas, you know, I remember I watched the original series from, because from Sprouts. And I remember, remember 
the seasons that you narrated, Thomas. I remember s- watching it from PBS Kids, and I remember like seeing seeing the the island of soda surrounded by beautiful blue sea. And I, every time I'm seeing it, I was like, oh my gosh! I remember <laughs> I remember watching that series so well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah. and they and they had me do all the voices, and I'll never forget. You know, when I do the accents, they'd really crack up. The, the the technicians would be on the floor, you know, and they'd do Ronald and Donald, the Scottish trains, you know. Oh, yeah. do, look, there's a tree on the track, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or or or, anyway. the, or the scenes where like Thomas or someone like like, like look out, or, or those type of scenes like that. Well, where actually, Thomas crashed or something. What I what I'm proud of is that. When I was doing the episodes, and I'd, I'd see they you know, only they the lines were were the lines, but I thought when Thomas would go off the track and go down the side of the mountain, you know, before he'd get onto uh, the track again or into a, a lake or something, there was no no sound, and I said, why can't Thomas go? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah. and that took a meeting. That was an English, I remember American, Texas. I mean, there was like four cities involved um, to come to that agreement. Okay, okay, all right, let's try it, you know. And that's, I started to give more life to the trains, you know, um, that they could, you know, have reactions to things uh, more than just the line, you know. I really loved doing that. It was yeah. it was really good. Yeah. Really a good yeah. It is, it is a good show. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um do you have a favorite Thomas the Friends character or episode? What in the Thomas thing? Yeah. Which yeah. character? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I love it. favorite episode too. Oh. Well, I I love the character of Diesel. You know, oh yeah, you know, love diesel. Uh, you're just, you know, he, I'm an oily. <laughs> you know, he <laughs> he was uh, he was a naughty character, and I had a lot of fun with Diesel. I also like Toby, the train. Oh yeah, yeah. He was so sweet, you know. Um, they were they were, they were all wonderful characters, you know. Uh, it was really good fun, I guess. There was um, and cranky, you know. Uh, oh yeah, oh, yeah. cranky. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there were a lot of different stories. I don't know how many hundred stories I've done. You know, it was like, you know, but we'd go in and it would time would stop. We just do when we do about a week, and we do uh, the whole batch of episodes for that season, and uh, yeah, it was really special. I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, do you do you have a favorite like because there were a bunch? Do you have a favorite Thomas and Friends song? Uh, uh, wow, that'd be tough. No, no, not a favorite. I like them. I mean, you know, I used to love when they were all in the shed, you know, and then they, and they sought the oh, songs yeah. and singing, you know, oh, yeah. uh, two, three, four, yeah. six, and they shout. Yeah, the track, song that they would do great. at the end. Yeah. What was or, your favorite? You have a favorite? I. I like the song "Gone Fishing." I think that was. I was really about to say that. I, was I think really that was before your that, era, but that's a good song. But yeah, yeah, that's a good song too. The longer version of the theme song that they do at the end of each of them, I like that one a lot. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, uh huh. Yeah, like that's that a too. good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, and then I used to love Gordon too. You know. Oh yeah, Gordon. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm the fastest train. And so do he's kind. You he's know? kind of a little bossy. And, and then there'd be the race like, is always between Thomas and Gordon. You know, to get there and things would happen. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yep. Uh, overall, how, overall, how does it feel to know that Thomas of France has become you know such a success throughout its long run? Well, it was at the end of my tenure. Um, in fact, it was about the fifth year they told me that they had sold more Thomas uh, merchandising and the ratings were higher than ever in the history of Thomas and Friends. And th- that was like, yay, you know, it, w- it was good. In fact, I'll tell you one funny dinner in, in London. I-, I was with some friends and um, the first time I'd met their son and all of a sudden he looked up from his plate 
we had just started eating dinner, and he said, Thomas, he recognized my voice. <laughs> and I wasn't even doing one of the characters. It's just, I guess, the narrator, you know. Um, uh, it was his, and like his face, Thomas. And his parents didn't know what was taking place here. And he came around and just stood there looking at me. It was like in a, a, a kind of a sci-fi world, you know. And I said, yes. And they went, what, what's going on here? I said, well, your, your son just busted me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the voice of Thomas, you know. So, um, yeah. And I and I love being the narrator and telling the stories, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's crazy that Wingo star who's – it was the first ever like narrator for Thomas and one of the members yeah. of the Beatles. Like that's crazy. Yeah. Now you guys uh, might know also if you're into you know other stuff. There was Dinotopia. Did you ever see Dinotopia where the dinosaurs talked? You know, um, it was like I, me and my two sons were flying. We taken. I was flying a plane and my got into a storm and we huh. crashed. And when we came ashore, we were hmm. in this world called Dinotopia. Huh, and I think I've mean, heard of it, yeah. I think I might have heard of it, heard but I'm not sure if I haven't yeah. seen it. Okay, there's oh, something so. to Google. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I was <laughs> yeah, doing nowadays. A, I was doing a, a chat. Martha Coolidge, um, she's a big director. She's done a lot of big movies. Um, yeah. She'd asked me to go to USC, I think it was, to talk to her directing students. Um, cause I directed some of Dempsey and Makepeace. I directed an, a show called Monsters in, um, uh, in the States. Um, anyway, uh, and I was talking all about this technical stuff and directing and, and what you have to do and what can happen. You never, you have to be flexible because, you know, the sun might not come out. It might rain. I mean, and then this one guy said, excuse me. I said, yes. He said, you were in Dinotopia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I had totally forgotten that I was. Yes, I was. <laughs> so, but it, you know, it was a day I reminded me of um, when I, I was directing the last episode of Dempsey and Makepeace. And, you know, there, there were things, you know, you, you try to, you have a vision of stuff, you know, but, you know, there was supposed to be this big country club and the gangsters. And all they got me was a, a little piece of cement that was like with a tennis court that was kind of really run down. And um, we put up a couple of tables and umbrellas, but it wasn't looking much like a country club. And then it started to pour. And I thought, wow, this is not working. And we're waiting like for the weather. And one of the actors, he's, he's gone now, but he was... Um, he, he was a big name over here named Richard Johnson. And uh, he said, have a word? I said, yeah. He said, you know, it rains at country clubs too. He went, right. Thank you, Richard. I said, okay, everybody over here. I said, get the actors. They were out there playing tennis, but they're going to be running in, covering their heads because it started to rain. I want somebody out there closing down the umbrellas because, you know, and everybody's running into the clubhouse. And all we had was a little cafe, but we just shot so little of it that we thought we're in a bar. And we had to make the day work. And it's about being flexible because that's, that's what it really is about. You know, you've got to make things work. You've got to carry on. Um, I, I remember... I worked with, uh, yeah, that's another long story. There's no way to tell that short story. In there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> huh? So, yeah, go ahead. That's your next question. <laughs> so um, real quick, because I know we're kind of running short on time. We have a friend who is a fan of your work on Thomas. His name is uh, Cole. And we were wondering if you could give him, he, he was going to originally be in this interview, but he, uh, had uh, some commitments for his work, so he wasn't able to do it. So we were wondering if you could give him like a quick little like hello as like the narrator for Thomas. You don't like this, I'll redo it. Hello, Cole. Sorry you found somebody better to talk to, 
But okay, we missed you anyway. Take it easy. <laughs> Is that all right? Yeah. That's awesome. I'm sure he'll love that. He'll love that. Um so yeah. This has been fun. Did so you know, um guys, you think you think got enough? You're gonna have to edit this together and shrink it down and Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's what we do. Man, yeah, we do it. yeah, so I guess um I guess since we're kind of wrapping up, we should kind of just ask the last like couple questions here. So um what like piece of advice would you want to give to anyone who wants to get into acting? Into acting? Wow. I tell you, it's a different world now. Acting's changed so much. Um, you know, we used to study hard, want to be really good actors. And the thing was to work on being yourself. Because the more you you can be, the more unique you are, you know? Definitely. Um, and don't act unless you have to. You try and make it real. Go with what you're given. Uh, what you're getting from that person or not getting. And, uh, but it's harder. I, I think it's much harder now because you used to have meetings where you could present your personality, where you could connect with somebody and, and you could take that material and do something special with it and adding yourself to it. Now it's pretty much a self tape and you only get to do it that one way you don't have a director you right, yeah. just you know saying words and then you send it in and it's not like where they might have seen you know maybe 50 actors for a part they're gonna have 300 self tapes so i i i i find it to be a much harder place um in this world now in this business as what it's become but hopefully there are still people who take an interest in you, in your work, in your presentation, and just try to give it that something extra, you know, what you can do and um, hope that they can see it. And good luck because yeah. you got to be tough. Yeah. You can't take it personally. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. Well, what would you like to say to the fans and supporters of your work and of Thomas and Friends? What? What? <laughs> say again? I, I, I said what I said, what would you like to say to the fans and supporters of your work and and Thomas? Well, I was grateful. I'm grateful that they they, they liked what I did. I mean, it, it wouldn't be what I did. They liked the characters, they liked the stories, they liked Thomas and Friends and the Island of Sodor and all the wonderful things that happened there. And I was just being part of that and trying to make it as real as possible and make, give each character some kind of uh, warmth, friendliness, except Diesel, maybe, <laughs> and his cronies, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah, steamy. <laughs> you know, but I mean, it's like, you know, that, and that was, it was having fun. It was just great, and everybody enjoyed it, and I was very grateful to have that opportunity for that long. It was wonderful. That yeah. Was awesome. 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 So, so if people would like to contact you, where can people find you? Well, I've got a website called michaelbrandon.net and uh, they can, they can uh, access that. Um, um, Twitter. I don't know how much longer that be with what's going on. Right. You never know. <laughs> but yeah. I think it's Mr. <laughs> M Brandon, the Twitter or something like that. Mm. Um, People do find me. A lot of Thomas people find me on Twitter. Um, nice. And awesome. um, yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, you know, that's where, to, and uh, there's an agency called CAM, uh, Creative Artist Management in London. And they can always go through, uh, I think it's info at cam.co.uk, something close enough if you look right. it up. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And, 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 and uh, what else? I and hopefully in in the new year, I'll be having a book. Um, nice, awesome. Ooh. Too much to tell, and it'll be sort <laughs> yeah. of more than fifty years in the business. Some of the stuff I told you wow. um, <laughs> uh, tonight today uh, will definitely be in there, and a lot of the amazing people. I got to work with, um, you know, uh, 
really uh, to experience to to you know I, I, I work with thousands of actors and directors and um, it's been an amazing experience and how I started the very first gig in film I wanted to learn about film I wanted to be in the movies so I got to stand in for Kirk Douglas um, on a movie called The Brotherhood. That means they measure the lights and focus on you. And, you know, you, you're not in it. I had a little dancing, you know, a bit in it. But, um, and watching movie stars, you know, really do their thing was quite amazing. And then years later, Michael Douglas and I became friends and he took me home for lunch. And I sat there opposite Kirk, dad, you know, and I said, you know, I understudied you. <laughs> That's how I oh, started. Awesome. <laughs> and he went, that would be what Marty Ritt was directing. <laughs> I said, That's right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, it's it's kind of like my reality exceeded my fantasy. Um, it yeah, gave definitely. me an opportunity in a world and people that just kind of continues on um, to, to be a wonder and something to be grateful about. Definitely. Anyway, yeah. thank you guys. Yeah. I hope you got what you, you need. And yes, thank you guys. <laughs> I, mean, I, have, I have one more question. So yeah, we'll just make it quick. Um, so yeah. this podcast is called Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. And in your words, how would you kind of define nostalgia? Or what does nostalgia mean to you? Remembering the good times. Yes. You know, thinking back on, on, on like some of these experiences and the people you know and the people you love, the people who you got to share moments with on your path. You know, music um, can always stimulate a moment of nostalgia, you know, where you were, what you were thinking. You know, I remember back in high school, we used to stand on the corner and harmonize. Boom, 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 do bop, doom, bop, doom, bop. You know, we used to do all, you know, I mean, it was like, that's nostalgia. You know, it, it brings me back to um, the good old days. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, yep, and, okay. and your website and your social media will be in the description down below so people can check out your website and follow you on social media. And yep. Things. yep. So, all right. Well, yep. Michael, thanks so much for being thank a guest. Thank you so much. And on thank the you podcast. so much. Yeah. And thank you so much for okay, what nice. you've done, Michael, and for what, you know, for us you know, being part of our childhood. You know, yep. you've been, Can't wait to see what's next in store and, for you. Yep. And hope you have a, hope you have a happy holidays. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Happy holidays. Stay well, boys. Yep. Thank you. You, thank you, you too. Take care, thank Michael. Thank you. I hope you have a great right. rest of your day. Right. See you, Michael. Okay. See ya. See ya. Take care, Michael. Well, everyone, we absolutely enjoyed our time with Michael Brandon. Obviously, we're all uh, big fans of Thomas. Um, but anyway, guys, again, we absolutely enjoyed our time with Michael Brandon. Yes. And until next time, more interviews coming up. And until next time, yep. remember to keep nostalgia alive. Goodbye, everybody. See you everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.